am very pleased to be introducing our first speaker who is Mandy Poole. Mandy has a degree in civil engineering and an MS in environmental engineering. Her studies and research have focused on wastewater treatment and renewable energies. Her research has focused on the development of point of use disinfection systems that rely on local, natural, and widely available materials for drinking water treatment. During her undergraduate years in Urbana, she was heavily involved in the student group Engineers Without Borders, an organization that aims to support community-driven development programs through the design and implementation of sustainable engineering projects, as well as with the UIUC Biodiesel Initiative and Solar Decathlon. And had it not been for being inspired about topics pertaining to water in high school, she probably would not have taken those paths, but I'll let Mandy touch on that herself. Um, at present, Poole works as an engineering consultant at Baxter and Woodman, a private Chicago-based engineering firm, where she focuses on wastewater treatment and energy reduction studies for primarily municipal clients. As a life goal, Poole seeks to assist in the development of a standardized system of environmental valuation of goods and services through a holistic approach to engineering and legislation. It is my pleasure to welcome Mandy Poole. Okay, well, th good morning. First of all, I want to thank Jamie for the kind introduction and for um, inviting me to speak here. I'm very happy to be in front of you this morning, um, and I'm hoping to keep this as a, open of a discussion as possible, so as you have questions, when they come up, feel free to raise your hands, questions, comments, anything, I'd be glad to you know, field the discussion. And since it's the first presentation in the morning, I don't want anyone falling asleep. Um, I also, I realized this morning when I was coming in here that my presentation is very lacking in photos of people. I mean, we're talking about the social aspects of water management, and there's not so much in my presentation, you know, as far as pictures of people with water. Um, so my saving grace here is the National Geographic. Um, in April, they put out a mag an issue on water in our thirsty world, and there's some fantastic photos in here. Um, I definitely can't rival that. So. I want you guys to flip through this while I'm speaking. Um, you, can, you can refrain from reading the articles, but you know, if you want to tab through, that'd be great. So again, my name is Mandy Poole. I'm talking about the social aspects of water management. Um, and I saw Jane Goodall speak a couple of weeks ago at the, um, at the Rockefeller Center. Was, it, was everyone else there? Um, OK, nobody? Jane was. OK, great. So she really inspired me in a few comments that she had, the first of which is, we have the choice to use our gi the gift of our lives to make the world a better place. And I think that that's what we do as educators, that that's what you do as educators, and I'm hoping that that's what the theme of this conversation can be about. Um, I'm also dedicating this talk to a good friend and colleague, Marin Summers. So Jamie gave you some background of myself. Um, I did my BS in civil engineering at U of I. Um, while I was there, I worked in a lab focusing on water treatment at the point of use scale. Now when you talk about international development with water quality issues, there's generally a tie between point of use, which means like household treatment, or a community development approach where you have kind of the same systems that we would have, and maybe one tap or household taps for water. Um, with that, I focused on the use of moringa seeds. It's almost like a soybean. It's a natural material that grows, um, that coagulates particulates in the water, and also viruses. So that was my study as an undergraduate. With my master's, I did environmental engineering, and uh, my focus for that was the efficacy of solar disinfection against enteroviruses. As many of you might know, um, when we talk about the millions of people that die annually, especially children, because of lack of poor water quality, generally enteroviruses are things, the diarrhea-causing diseases that we're talking about. Um, again, uh, Engineers Without Borders was something that I was very involved with. Um, they work on social development. That's something that I think is very important for engineers and for other students to be involved with. It's very important for us to have socially conscious en uh, engineers as we try and develop these systems so that the cultural aspects don't get forgotten. A good project that has to take into account whether or not people will use it the right way. Um, and then lastly, I did this, um, well, I work for um, Baxter and Woodman right now. I'm an environmental engineer there. I split time, probably 75% 70, of my time is wastewater engineering and 25% is energy studies. <coughs> So since it's, a, since it's the first presentation of the day, I kind of want to remind us why we're talking about water and what, why it's such a significant issue. Of course, the human relationship with water is one of the first things that comes to mind. We use water for drinking, for cooking, bathing, recreation, manufacturing, agriculture, anything and everything. Water is our life source. When you look at the subcontext of environmental issues, unfortunately, economics, more often than not, is at the center of that. 
And it's a big disappointment. In fact, I would challenge you to come up with any environmental situation in which politicos are involved and money is not at the bottom of it. Um, the way our society is structured, our bottom line is in dollars and cents, and it's not in the size of our ecological footprints. But the value of water is much beyond what we can measure economically. We're seeing this with all the events that are taking place in the Gulf right now, that the water quality of our major water bodies has massive impacts and broad ranging ones from fishing industries and tourism to the most basic levels of life and our food chains. But again, more often than not, human impact is the first and primary consideration given, and that's particularly on industry, tourism, quality of life, and the things that are the lowest considered are the effects on our wildlife and long-term resource protection. So here's a, uh, this is the estimate as of June 10th of where the uh, extent of the oil spill was. Uh, as you can see, it's almost on the same scale as some of the states in the area, and it's definitely on the same scale of some states in the Northeast. So it's massive geographical extent. Now, the problem with an economic approach is that things like this, a bird covered in oil from the disaster, don't have much economic value, if they have any. So from the problems, from the impacts on wildlife related to acute disasters like the BP oil spill, where a one-time accident might have short or long-term effects, to the impact of long-term negligence or apathy on proper water treatment, we can see a very human effect. What you're looking at here is a nutrient pollution problem in Qingdao Port, China. Qingdao Port was where the Olympic sailing teams took out from uh, in the 2008 games. And what you're looking at is not grass. The green is actually algae. Now a nutrient, I say it's nutrient pollution, and a nutrient might sound like a good thing, but here we're talking specifically about nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, these things promote growth, um, but in general we're talking about nutrients that aren't present and are introduced in an unnatural way, and they promote growth that shouldn't be there. So cells generally, I, I meant to do this in the beginning, but who is a, um, who are science teachers here? Okay, great. What about math teachers? Economics? Geography? Social science? Okay, language arts? Okay, so for those of you um, science geeks, uh, a cell formula generally is considered to be something like C5, H7, NO2. So you have a little bit, mostly carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, a little bit of nitrogen, and even less phosphorus. P is something like 0.2 in that cell formula. Um, we need other trace metals for survival. It's like taking, taking your vitamins, it promotes healthy growth, but these are in much lower quantities. So just as nitrogen and phosphorus are usually less available, available in the environment, these are the things that limit growth. So eutrophication is the process that we refer to that as. Eutrophication is a process where water bodies receive excess nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, that stimulate unnecessary growth. Um, basically what happens is that algae starts to grow at the top of the lakes, it blocks oxygen transfer into the water, it blocks sunlight from going to the lower vegetations that grow at the bottom, and then as that algae decomposes, it falls to the bottom and it consumes more oxygen as it decomposes. So the big problem with these nutrients is that they create dead zones where there's no oxygen in the water to support plant life as low as plankton and fish. And that has, mat it has ripple effects up into higher life forms. Okay, so here's the effects. What you're looking at here is a research project done by Schindler. I don't know where the, uh, the ethics of this <laughs> fall in, but this was done in 1974 on, a lake, on lake Camden in Ontario. Um, basic what, what he did is to section off the lake. Um, how many of you have been to the Boundary Waters? All right, great. Yeah, these the Boundary Waters are basically the waters between Minnesota and Canada, and they're some of the most pristine lakes in the U.S. They're just perfect water quality. And I would, uh, this is um, a lake of sw similar quality. So basically, Schindler sectioned off this lake into two parts. On the right side, he added phosphates, which is our phosphorus source. And you can see the effect. I mean, it's blatantly clear that there's all this growth because phosphorus was n is not normally present, and it's been added in a co concentration that supports that growth. So in other locations, this is back to Shingdao Port. You can see the effect. These are people trying to clean it out of the port. Um, with phosphorus, it's kind of like, with nitrogen, it's less of an issue. But because phosphorus is so small in cell material, when you have it, it creates a ton of growth. So if you give it an inch, it takes a mile. One part phosphorus supports 30 parts of cell, gro cell growth. So you know, if you give it anything, it's going to get out of control really fast. And people get stuck in it. 
and therefore you can assume that fish and other wildlife also get stuck in it. And there's a the sailboat. Um, but if you think this is a local problem, you have to think again. The Gulf has this hypoxic zone that has been estimated to be the size of the state of New Jersey. So when you're talking about the oil disaster, I understand that that's a very acute problem. It happened one time, but it's been the, in the news for, I mean, every day since it happened. This is something that's been happening for years, and there's been no national media on it. So what's the difference in that? Why does our culture pick up on the things that have quick people to blame and not more chronic problems like this one. So what I would like to cover with you today is our water culture. How do we use and abuse our water resources? And how does our culture of health and hygiene impact our water quality? Um, when I talk about culture, what I mean is the sum total of ways built up by our civilization and passed down into following generations. There's a really interesting concept of sustainability. I think m many of you have probably heard of this. Um, well, there's one concept of sustainability that's the centered seven generation concept, where you're supposed to leave things in the same condition or in better condition for generations, seven generations from now. Um, and it's a really difficult problem to address when you're talking about water quality, because it, as it stands currently, we're putting things into our water bodies that we don't know how to take out, that we don't know how to treat. And so thinking of this in, in sustainability terms, I want you to have that in the back of your mind during this presentation. So again, water use and abuse, our attitudes towards water quantity and quality, and then human health and hygiene and its impact on our environmental health. So to begin with, I'd like to tell you about a state case study that I had uh, the opportunity to participate in. Um, this was with the University of Illinois in a collaboration with Universidad de las Américas in Puebla, Mexico. Um, we were funded by the Water Campus, which is a UIUC-based research organization that focuses on the, advanced, um, on the development of advanced materials for water treatment and UIUC and UDLAP. Um, and the objective of the project was given to us as to provide improved water supplies to the community. That's all the information we had, and away we went. So here's the project site. Mexico City is just a little bit above, I think it's the, just the dot to the left of the A. The A is the state of Puebla. Um, and our community was about two or three hours south, two and a half hours south of Mexico City. It's in a, um, it's in a landlocked and arid, arid area. It's very mountainous. And the only access to the community is via a dirt road. The main livelihood there is milk and cheese production. Um, and they have no waste treatment. So if they have garbage, they drive a couple miles away and they throw it off the side of the road. And if they have toilets, the toilet flushes and it goes out to a pipe, but the pipe just ends somewhere and it, there is no treatment of that waste. It's just discharge. Now this is a big problem all across major cities in Mexico. Um, there's minimal or no wastewater treatment, both for industries and municipalities. Um, so raw sewage is directly, is directly discharged into rivers and streams in town, which leaves highly contaminated waste streams going through very close to where people live. Um, I would this would be something that you could imagine like Bubbly Creek in, that, in Chicago at the turn of the century. These are some of the pictures of it. You can see rags and other debris in the trees. Um, these photos don't really do justice to how terrible the problem is. I mean, when you go there, sometimes there's two feet of just suds from various detergents in the water and soaps. All kinds of bubbles and it smells bad, but all kinds of debris in here. Yeah, yeah that's true in Mexico City. Um, actually, when we were right before we left for the project, this, uh, they have the same problem in Guadalajara City. Um, and right before we left, a kid fell into a river there, and he died a couple days later from acute toxicity from heavy metal contamination of the water body. So, you know, as a general rule, ingestion is way worse than inhalation. Inhalation is way worse than dermal contact. So if someone's to fall in the river and dermal contact causes death, it gives you an idea of how grave the situation is. But the water flows through the cities. Um, in this case, you're looking at the watershed on the left. These rivers flow into the Presa Valsequia is the Valsequia Reservoir. Um, basically, dams serve as to hold water so that you have a constant stream over time. They'll retain water back and they let out the same amount. So when you're holding all this water and you're letting very low flows come through, you have a lot of sedimentation of the particles that are in the dam. So there's a lot of problems with this dam. Um, one of them is that the capacity has dropped over time. Because you have so much sedimentation, it goes from, like starts to fill up at the bottom, basically, and you lose capacity. So in 20 years, they lost half their capacity um, in the dam. Another problem is that because you have all this sedimentation, 
you know, within, when you're talking about sewage and wastewater, one of the biggest things is oxygen demand. Compounds are kind of categorized altogether as a form of oxygen demand. So when things decompose and they break down, it's more, you know, just carbon and simple sugars. They consume oxygen in that. And that's, again, back to the dead zones. Um, so dams have this problem of creating massive dead zones, oxygen demands. And um, the other problem is that when heavy metals come into dams, they change form. So heavy metals are less bioavailable when they're aerobic conditions. And when they're in anaerobic or low oxygen conditions, they start to become more, more toxic. So about 100 kilometers downstream lies the village of um, Los Llanos, which is the community that we were working with. Um, Los Llanos, well, when we were visiting, this is a period of low flow, very low flow, in fact. Um, I said it's a mountainous and arid region, and that's definitely true. But they have rainy and dry seasons. When you're looking at this picture, it's low flow. But um, so that you know it's been taken, the rainy season ha before they've lost the bridge to the rain. So, and that's about a 20 foot high level variation over a very wide plain. So they get massive changes in water quantity. Um, now the water looks clear. I'm sorry, I don't have more of like an overhead picture. The water looks clear by the time it gets to the village, aside from some algae problems. But it doesn't appear to be contaminated otherwise if you're looking for color or particulates as your indicators. But as we know, there are many other things that might be in the water, like pathogens, um, bacteria, viruses, and protozoa that might contaminate the water source. Um, here you see the pigs in the stream. Um, it's also the drinking water source for the village's livestock. So when we were there during our short stay, we saw pigs, cattle, chickens, dogs, all the animals in the village, they go there to bathe, swim. They do everything that animals do all in the water. And um, while the villagers there try and maintain their water, they clean things upstream, they bathe upstream, they get their drinking water upstream. But you have to understand that while even you try, and do, try to do those small things, there's villages upstream of them that do the same. So, I mean, you really need this whole, you need a whole holistic view of how to deal with this problem. So the alternative water source is this pit well. They dug it into the dirt. Um, it's just clay and sand, so it's not very, I mean, you get a lot of particulates falling into there. But what you don't see in this picture is that there's a pig pen just to the right of it. Um, poor site planning, I know. But, um, but either way, if, I mean, if you have rainwater, you could see the point where you might get bacterial contamination from rainwater going into the well. But that's going to happen whether or not you have rainwater. Bacteria and other, other water contaminants migrate through the soil. They make it through the soil and they'll get back into this well. So this is not the best way. All they do with this is take water out and let it sit in a bucket for a while before they take the water to drink. Um, now to bring this full circle, I want to remind you that the objective of, of our project, though vaguely stated, was to provide improved water supplies to the community. Now in their mind, that meant they wanted a storage facility to keep water from the wet season and hold it for the dry season so that they didn't have conditions with this low water. In our minds, that's you guys need some way to clean your water. Um, and we really didn't see eye to eye on that. And no matter how we tried to, tried to convince them to consider the health impacts of unclean water on their community, they just didn't see the need for such, a, such measurements. So actually looking at one of the rain barrels back there, there's a Jacques Cousteau um, quote on it that says, don't forget that the water cycle and the life cycle are one. I think that's really interesting. But that's something that they had pointed out. You know, water's our life. Water is our community. But you need to understand that the water that brings you your community brings the life to your community, can also cause problems with your, you know, can shorten your life. Right. Um, the, the question was, what, what's the situation with the roofs, um, the, the barrels on the roofs? Basically, Mexico, a lot of places in Mexico, I'm not sure, I can't speak specifically for um, each city, but I know a lot of places have these blue or, um, or black tanks on the, on the roofs, and basically that's to keep They'll lose power sometimes, so when you have, or the power is like intermittent, basically. So when you have pumping, you pump it to your reservoir and you hold it there in case the water goes out, in case the pumps goes out, so that you have water pressure in your system. And that way you're able to hold water. It doesn't do any, it's no treatment, and it's not rain water, it's actually pumped water. But as we'll talk about later, there's issues with that too, because when you have piped water, if it's not disinfected, there's issues with post-contamination. After treatment, they do have water treatment facilities. But there's issues with post-contamination after it leaves the treatment, once it's going through the pipe. And that's, w that's one of the ways to do that. I mean, you've got this big tank that's painted black or a dark color, and it's on the top of a roof, and it's in hot conditions. You're going to get bacterial growth even within there. So 
the water and water and wastewater situation is not as safe as it should be. So here's the final outcome. Um, a reservoir was built and we left the community with plans to develop a drinking water treatment system if and when they're ready for it. Um, but I guess the outcome was really disappointing for me because it comes down to policy. There needs to be a framework to guide people into making safe decisions so that lack of education and money don't become the reasons that health is compromised. If you think about this in terms of a water, of an entire watershed management scenario, even if the community of Los Llanos implements water protection standards, there are communities upstream that won't have it or that don't have it and they have the same issues with people upstream of them contaminating their drinking water. So, you know, who's, who's to stop them from acting as bu business as usual? Um, the problem is a pro chronic problem on a regional scale and it makes you wonder if we're just spitting in the ocean. So there also needs to be a significant e educational aspect of international projects that links sanitation to health. Um, and what's been consistently found with both domestic and international projects is that in order to ensure long-term maintenance and upkeep of the system, the community has to have some kind of vested interest. Usually financial investment will keep the community interested in making sure that their hard-earned money doesn't fall to the wayside when a pump breaks or a pipe, or a pump fails or a pipe breaks. Um, so the, the community should be involved with the what's in the house from the very beginning um, with raising funds for construction, operation and maintenance. And if they don't feel like they own the system, they're not gonna maintain it. <coughs> So as with the Puebla example, um, there's usually two major considerations with water. It's water quantity and water quality. Um, in the US, we also have some very water scarce regions. You're looking at a drought status map um, in the Southwest. I apologize, this is kind of outdated. It's from July 2002. But um, the diagram basically shows um, burnt red is the most severe drought and yellow is the most moderate. So drought conditions change from year to year, but as we're well aware, the Southwest has a problem with this consistently, that, that consistently results in water shortages. Um, and despite the drought conditions that we have in the Southwest, there's still many areas like this, just outside of Reno, Nevada, where the natural vegetation is nothing but desert, and the human impact is clearly visible in all the green spaces. Um, it's our culture of having this perfect green lawn, despite the adverse conditions. This is a, this is a location where desert scape and natural vegetation are being replaced by grass that requires constant watering. And it's like, why? What's the point of that? Another example is in Palm Desert, California. That's right, Palm Desert. Um, you know, I once had a professor that discussed with us what, like, what is the quality of the word, or what does the meaning of the word drought? And there's no such thing as a drought when there's no human imp impact considered. A drought implies that there's a shortage of water. A short of a shor shortage of water implies that there's a human need for more water. So all beautiful weather and the views of places like Palm Desert and Los Angeles are great and you know they might sound a lot better than the blistery cold snowy weathers and the ultra humid summers that we have in Chicago. We're inherently living a more sustainable lifestyle by being in the Midwest. So give yourselves a small pat on the back but that's a good thing. Um, actually also in the National Geographic that's going around there's an article about this um, new kind of, not new kind but a different kind of grass that requires less watering. Um, it's about halfway through and I should have tabbed it and I apologize that I didn't but if you want to discuss that afterwards, I'll find that. There's also this, um, I've heard this advertisement on the radio a few times, you know, the California cows make happy cows. Um, and I, I don't doubt that they like the climate in California a lot better than they do in Wisconsin. I probably would too. But if they don't have water to drink, then I don't think they'll be happy very long. So what about our culture in Chicago? Um, we get our drinking water from the cribs in the lake. These were installed in the late 1800s, 1880 or so. Um, and that was when the Chicago ri River flew into the lake. In 1900, the Sanitarian Ship Canal was, was created and built, um, and the Chicago River was reversed so that it, it carries our sewage and now our treated effluent wastewater away from our drinking water source. Good thinking. Um, but much of our drinking water and sewer lines were installed around the same time, and they're installed usually parallel to each other so that when you have a problem, you don't have to tear up both sides of the road if you have two different problems. Um, but this was made, a lot of the, a lot of the pipes then were made of brick or clay, and for some strange reason, they still install brick and clay man manholes and sewers around Chicago, which is beyond me, but that was either before we understood that mortar would erode over time, or before we understood that the investments that people made in these infrastructure systems was really intended to be kind of a one-time thing. So a lot of our drinking water lines leak, and so do the sewer lines that run next to them. Therefore, there's a lot of potential for contamination of our drinking water. And this is why, if you ever wondered, we 
treat water for, we treat our drinking water for germs and other pathogens at the treatment plant, but we have to post chlorinate. We put chlorine into our systems so that it's safe between the point where it leaves the treatment plant and it enters our homes. You know, Germany, a lot of Germans hate the taste of chlorine and they just, when they come visit here, they just complain about it constantly. And I can understand that because it's not necessarily a pleasant taste if you, you know, if you like your Fiji more than, more than your tap water, it might be because of the chlorine. But we have to do that because Germany's infrastructure was updated after World War II because they had so much destruction. We don't have that luxury here. So why don't we invest in new pipelines? It might be because there's no change in service for the money that's required for it, and so there's, people don't see the justification for it. Um, or maybe it's because we consider water to be a common right, and if it's a common right, it should be commonly affordable, right? Um, it's something that everyone le needs to live. But just as an aside, um, the EPA recently stated that they wanted the Chicago waterway system to be swimmable based on categorical regulations, and there was a whole lot of fuss about it, and Chicago was up in arms completely, and um, the reaction was anything but accepting, but I read an article recently that commented on how Chicago's historical stance has been, well, sure, you can canoe on the river, but just don't fall in. Um, which, you know, not to mention why such resistance, but doesn't this have tones of that kid in Guadalajara that, you know, it's, it's safe as long as you don't go into it? And what are, we, what are we promoting here? I mean, we have the technology to make this cleaner. We have the technology to do it better. Anyway, back on track. Um, Drinking water protection and wastewater pollution are really one and the same. Green Bay's drinking water, well, drink, Green Bay's wastewater becomes Milwaukee's drinking water. Milwaukee's wastewater becomes our drinking water. Our drinking, our wastewater becomes St. Louis's and so on and so forth down to New Orleans. Um, wastewater treatment's all about solid liquid separation. Like I mentioned, um, co compounds that exert an oxygen demand are basically the most regulated ones. And those are, I mean, that's everything from organics and inorganics both. Um, metals are also, regulated and treated, and so are pathogens. Um, but nutrients are not, going back to the nutrient discussion, these are not usually treated in primary or secondary wastewater treatment. Um, I can get into some more of the wastewater treatment steps, the process, but I gave you guys a resource on that, and you can look through it in your own time, and if you have questions at lunch or something, just let me know. <coughs> but another major category of untreated or unregulated compounds is micropollutants. Um, and these, these come anything in personal care products. Those are your soaps, shampoos, detergents, uh, deodorants, uh, as well as pharmaceutical ingredients. Those are your, um, what do you call those? The things, well, your pills. Um, so aspirin, Motion and IV, those things. Um, and prescriptions, that's the word, sorry. <laughs> but, and then also things like pesticides and even these quirky compounds like caffeine. These things come into the wastewater treatment plant and they come out of the wastewater treatment plant. They're not removed. Um, some of them might be harmless, and this list is, is not inclusive, and neither are the effects. So some of them have no effects. Some of them have, are related to carcinogenic effects. Some are endocrine disruptors. Um, but really, the issue here is that we don't know. And a lot of these are unstudied and are unregulated because we don't know how to treat them. Um, a US Geological Survey of Boulder Creek in Colorado took a look at the fish species before and after the wastewater treatment plant outfall. And beforehand, it's about 50-50 male to female ratio. And then after the outfall, it goes up to 90-10 female to male. Um, so similar studies have shown this effect in fish and frogs. And while this goes back to the, well, okay, okay it's wildlife, what do we care? Well, we care because it has effects on lower life forms and therefore it could be indicative of, of effects in humans. To make matters worse, over 80,000 new micropollutants, microchemicals, excuse me, are introduced to the market each year. Many of these are un untested, and almost all of them are unregulated. Well, did you have a question? Okay. Um, so to give you an example of how ubiquitous some of these compounds are, we're going to look at tri triclosan, which is a dis disinfectant. <coughs> it's actually probably the disinfectant that you're most likely to have in your household compounds. It's in everything. So it goes from soft soap, it's your hand soap, it's your dish soap, um, to toothpaste. Now there are natural bacteria that you should have in your mouth. They promote healthy digestion, healthy consumption of food, but we need to be, um, apparently we need to be very concerned about those. <laughs> and then it goes to things like socks, where, so that you don't have ba odor causing bacteria growing on your feet, and cutting boards and knives. It's just in everything. Um, and the question that I pose to you is that how did we survive as a civilization for so many thousands of years without, without disinfecting soap? 
I mean, if we did it then, why do we need it now? Um, to me, this feels like two steps forward and three steps back. I want to point out that these personal care products and pharmaceuticals are some of the biggest offenders. And it's like we're hyper-cleaning our personal spaces and we're polluting the environment around us with things that we don't know how to treat and we don't know how to take out. Um, and back to that seven, seven generation thing, I mean, this is going to be a significant impact, if not now, down the line, and it's going conti to continue until there's major ch changes in the way that we do business. I think a lot of the time people think that, I know my dad thinks this, that you know, if you put bleach in your house, it cleans things, and then if you put it down the, uh, down the drain, well, it's also going to kill things there, right? But you have to realize that these chemicals are designed to be ultra-reactive, and they react with everything, and they react differently with everything. And therefore, there's no way for us currently to predict the outcome of these kind of chemical interactions. So how could we do this better? I mean this both in terms of, um, excuse me, I mean this both in terms of treatment strategies and in considering the source of the problem, our consumer demands. First of all, I think that regulation at the, at the source of generation is a big one. Stop the pollution before it starts. Um, there was a really successful agreement between the US EPA and detergent manufacturers several years ago that resulted in complete elimination, well, near complete elimination of phosphates from household detergents. So if you look at your clothing detergent, your dish detergent now, you look at the back of it and it says contains no phosphates. That's not true for industrial, uh, industrial detergents, but it is a start. Um, and secondly, we need a paradigm shift between, uh, by producers and chemical manufacturers to a, a type of production where we know what we're making, we know it's an impact on human health, and we know how to take it out of drinking water before they put it on the market. To give you an example, I was at a wastewater conference recently, and there was a representative, and an engineer from the Department of Defense, and he was talking about these, um, these new insensitive um, chemical explosives that they're using. So sensitive chemical explo explosives are like your RDX, Royal Demolition Explosives, and TNT. Um, and those are ones where if you bump into it, it might detonate. And so I can understand the need for these ones that are insensitive, where you can more, you know, you don't have to worry so much about um, premature explosions. But um, basically what he was talking about is that with these insensitive ones, we were finding them in drinking water. They were used since the 50s. And in places that have arsenals or that ever had um, explosive manufacturing facilities, they're, they're coming up in the drinking water. Now, we don't know how to take care of them yet. We're just now figuring out better ways to take them out, but it's still a major problem. Um, but all that aside, they're developing these new compounds that they don't know how to treat, and they're putting them into explosives now, and they're putting those into places where it can get washed into our drinking water, it can get washed into the environment, and there's no way to treat them. So to scare your pants off. <laughs> um, but I, like, I said, like I said earlier, I saw the lecture by Jane Goodall, and I was really inspired. Um, and one thing that she said, again, was if we don't dare to envision a world of peace, it'll never come. And I think that if we don't dare to ask for more responsible management of our resources and our health, that will never come. So we need creative solutions. We need to recognize that the water system that works for us is not the one that's going to work everywhere else in the world. And we need to want realize that the one that we have working right now isn't necessarily the best one. We need socially conscious, open-minded engineers, and unfortunately that's kind of an oxymoron. But we, that's why we need more organizations like Engineers Without Borders, Water for Peace, or Water for People, Potters for Peace, organizations that combine the social and science. And we need to get away from this dollar and cent bottom line approach. Um, and as educators, I urge you, whenever you're talking about science, or I'm sorry, about water, you always have to think about things in terms of water, sanitation, and sustainability. They all go together. Energy is a little, little sector of wastewater, but these three are the main, the main ones. Now, Danielle's going to cover a lot of these later in the afternoon, but some of the creative solutions that have come out of, out of this, whole, um, this whole dilemma are solar disinfection. Solar disinfection is an alternative, alternative to chemical disinfection. So instead of putting chlorine into our drinking water, this is especially for point of use treatment again, use solar disinfection. Um, there's also the Google bike. Google had a competition several years ago where they funded um, the most inventive ideas for water treatment. One of these was instead of carrying 50 pounds of water on your head and walking two kilometers, put it in the back of this bike, pedal, and it'll pump the it'll treat the water while you pedal. Another one is Potters for Peace, um, these ceramic filters. And these are a way of simple and low energy drinking water solutions that take out some of the major contaminants and even some of the pathogens.
So in terms of long-term long -term thinking, and to totally blow your mind with this one, Los Angeles has a massive issue with their water scarcity. Um, they get their drinking water from three sources. One is a 600-mile aqueduct from Upper California, the San Francisco region. region. Another one is a 240-mile aqueduct that carries water from the Colorado River. Um, and I'm going to stop here for a second. The Colorado River, um, the flow allocation, the legal regulated flow allocation was based on high flow. They didn't know that at the time, but basically instead of giving percentage allocations, they gave total quantities. And so now that they're in low flow conditions, the water, the river runs dry at the end. It doesn't make it to its old endpoint. It barely makes it to Mexico. Um, their other water source is an underground aquifer. Um, the problem with aquifers in, this, in that area is that you're on a continental shelf. So when you're pumping water out, you always have something replacing it. And in this case, while you're pulling it out, salt water is starting to, to replace it. So you get more and more brackish water as you continue to pump. And that's 55% of the total. So that's a degrading water source. And then if there's any kind of political strife in the area or any earthquakes or other natural disasters, they have some serious water um, quantity issues and the population continues to grow. So they've, done, they've take, taken it upon, them, upon themselves to secure one of the surest water sources, their own wastewater. It always flows. Um, so the system was originally designed in the 90s, and it, was, it caught a lot of bad publicity because it was coined toilet to tap. Some, some good, uh, you know, good cartoons in the newspaper, but not good for your PR. So the, problem was, uh, the program was restarted in two, 2004 um, as the water scarcity problem worsened. And it's now in place. These indirect water reuse systems are in place in Singapore, near Washington, D.C., and I just heard that Atlanta is getting one, too. Um, so going forward, what can we do? We need a major paradigm shift in our culture from one of consumption without regard to the resource that we have to one of recognition of the value and protection. Water is a privilege. It's not a right. And there we, therefore, we can't expect it to be free and flowing all the time. Um, let's remember that, I don't know if this was covered before, but I'm sure that you've heard in the past that 97% of the Earth's water is salt water. Of the remaining 3%, 2% of it is locked up in glaciers and ice. So we have 1% of the water on Earth to drink. And that's the same water that's been here since the dinosaurs were around. And that's not going to change. And the, you know, the water that we're polluting isn't going to magically turn into to salt water. Or it's not going to go into the, um, to the icebergs. But this is something we need to consider. We need to maintain this very precious resource that we have. And to further push the idea that we need legislative changes and not just an adjustment of personal choices, though we do need that, um, consider these two points. First of all, more than 90% of water used by humans is used by agriculture and industry. The remaining 10% is split between municipalities and actual living, breathing human beings. 10%, less than that. And secondly, collectively, municipal golf courses use as much water as human beings. And I mean, so you can do all, you can take all the short showers in the world that you want to, and you can make as many personal lifestyle changes as you can, but it's going to have a limited effect on the water crisis situation. We need change from above, too. But that's with water management and water qu quantity. I really do think that we still have the option to make an impact on the water quality as individuals. Um, unfortunately, in our capitalist society, our purchases represent our votes, and therefore we need to make a statement in what products we choose to use and consume. Um, so some further considerations to bring back to your classroom. Um, for philosophy teachers and for economics, um, first of all, is water a basic human right? There was a really good article in the, um, in the BBC a couple months ago about the Maoist movement in Thailand. And one thing that it said is, um, our, our correspondent says that it bitterly condemns Maoist violence, but it acknowledges that chronic poverty and lack of opportunity and development are significant factors which have given the insurgency added impetus. Now, I know you had a presentation yesterday, for those of you that were here, on water quality, or on, on water issues, and their impact on national security and on civil unrest. Um, but we need to ensure, basically, that we need to take the attitude that we, take, we try the best to make sure that every person in the world has an equal right to water and to development, um, and our wa water laws have to be sensitive to that. As far as why is water not prioritized? Um, water was in the Millennium Development Goals that the UN put out. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, the Millennium Development Goals basically identified different priorities for improving the Human de Development Index and uh, water, human quality of life in different areas of the world. Um, water was in it. It was Goal 7, Task 3. And they said to cut in half by 2015, the proportion of the population without sustainable access to safe drinking water 
and basic sanitation. And they note that almost half the world's population faces a scarcity of water. In developer, developing regions, one in four has no sanitation. And though access to improved drinking water has expanded, nearly one billion people in the world do without improved drinking water sources. Now, with those facts, and considering that water is one of the few things that you absolutely need to live, why is it goal seven, task three? Why isn't it goal one, task one? So these are things that we should consider. Um, as far as economics, I know you guys watched Flow also. Um, this gets into kind of the privatization issue. Um, the tragedy of the commons is something that I, I like to think about. Um, and the tragedy of the commons is a, uh, was coined by Garrett Hardin, and it says that ruin is the destination toward which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the, in the, common, in the freedom of the commons. And freedom of the commons brings ruin to all. Now that's debatable, but basically, I mean, if, if we have this shared pool of water, I might take a little bit more, and you might take a little bit more, and he might take a little bit more, until we realize that we're finally really abusing our water situation. And that's the, that's the issue with this. So the solution that's been, that's been ph philosophized is mutual coercion mutually agreed upon. Or in other words, fair regulation among industries and among sectors of society. So some other items of brief import that we can talk about afterwards are the following. Um, the first five are things I think that we can use at the household level and in your classrooms, and that's to encourage tap water over bottled water, um, the use of rain barrels. Rain barrels are fantastic for lowering the peak flows that go into streams and river bodies, and that causes massive erosion, sedimentation, um, and it also, it also encourages percolation of the water into our groundwater sources, so that we're recharging the aquifers that we have um, use of biodegradable chemicals for household cleaners, proper disposal of your personal care products and pharmaceuticals. When you have your old medicine, don't just toss it into the garbage, bring it to a safe facility, um, and lowering or eliminating our personal use of fertilizers and pesticides. Um, now, LEED focuses on, LEED from the U.S. Green Building Council, focuses on encouraging the installation of low-flow fixtures, but this is really a measure that only applies for new buildings, new construction, it's not really something that we can do for retrofitting unless, unless you have a, you know, a household project or your school's undergoing revisions, then you can push for it. But you know, again, since this isn't a priority in their terms, we need to push for it to, be a, to become a priority as far as our legislation goes. Um, so once again, there's this yin and yang, but because, there's an, because we have a clean personal environment, doesn't that we're make, mean that we're making things clean outside? In our hygiene culture and this germ scare that we have is about as unsustainable as you can imagine. So try and make personal choices that encourage clean development. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that there's a great resource on the Environmental Working Group. It's ewg.org. Um, that's a great place to check for updates and learn more about water quality issues. And again, it's Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. So I want to thank you all very much for your attention. Um, I know it's early, but I hope you can bring some of this enthusiasm back to your classroom. I also want to thank Water Campus, uh, UIUC, Baxter and Woodman for allowing me to be here, um, Jamie Bender for organizing this awesome workshop, um, and for inviting me to speak. So um, Jamie has a few resources up on the web, and if you have questions about those, you're welcome to find me afterwards and talk about it, basically about embedded water content, as well as water treatment plants and what's taken out and what's not. So at this point, I'd like to discuss if anyone has questions. Uh -huh. That's being used in LA, you said, and Singapore and Washington, D.C. Right. Is that what that is? Uh, now, what are the criticisms? Is it, is it effective? Is it good? Has it got all the good things about it? It is. Um, they're very safe. You meet some crazy operators for these treat treatment plants every once in a while, and they'll take, their, they'll take their glass of water and they'll put it right under and they'll drink it. Now, I don't necessarily encourage that, but what's going on in Los Angeles is that they have drinking water treatment, they have primary, secondary, and then advanced tertiary treatment, where usually we go into disinfection, which is like kind of tertiary light, um, but they have advanced tertiary treatment that disinfects for chemicals. Um, again, they don't have, they have more, um, they have some more systems in place to take out some of these personal care products, um, but like I said, not all of them are treated the same way. Um, but then after that, basically, it goes into a reservoir where there's natural attenuation for a period of six months. And so they put the water into this reservoir, they let it sit for a while, let it get some more air, and then it goes into their drinking water treatment plant. Are they using ozone at all for purification? You know, I don't know if they use it in, in LA. I would assume that they probably do. There's a lot of, um, 
there's a lot of synergy with different disinfectants. So chlorine's really, I mean, chlorine's very effective against certain pathogens. UV is very effective against certain pathogens. Um, but what, what they've found recently is that some of the ones that are most resistant to chlorine are least resistant to ozone or to UV. Those are oxidating compounds, and chlorine's less of a, it oxidates in a different way, I guess. Um, so when you combine these different disinfection they techniques, more. they're more effective, and it's, oh. you know, one plus one's more than two. Oh. So I would be, so I, I do believe that they're using ozone, um, but there are also issues with using ozone. You can create from a, from a compound that's not so bad, you can ozonate it, and it can become something that's worse. And again, this is a lot of the science that we don't understand. So is that, do you think that's going to spread that whole idea of water cycle in a circle like they're doing it? No, I think so in some of the very water stressed places. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's likely for Chicago, but um, definitely Florida is probably going to start looking into it. Florida has the same problem with saltwater intrusion into their groundwater sources. Um, Atlanta, like I said, Singapore is an island, it's an island state, so they have no other no other and they have nothing else to go to it. Right. That's, yeah. so. That's great. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all very much. <laughs>